<laughs> India is beautiful, and you're so beautiful. Thank you, Mrs. Spencer. And you're a lucky man, son. I made you some coffee, and I have a surprise for you. Your favorite? OK. It's a, it's a, it's a, mo it's a... Samosas. 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 Thank you. परसों से प्यार जताने का तरीका हल्दीराम Whatever you did, if it wasn't good enough, you needed to try and do better and keep at it. Actually, village life produces the philosophical ideas that are germane to democratic thought and practice. I mean, just losing four of your bandmates, soulmates is bad enough. But the worst thing is out of those four families, two of the families blamed me. But the progress from 1991 to 2017, I think, only took India to a better place. It was really through the, uh, th through the transition into politics that I, uh, that I had the good luck of becoming a writer. Good afternoon. We are delighted to welcome you to the session of the 9th JLF London at the British Library, supported by Haldi Rams. It is our pleasure to present today Pride, Prejudice, and Panditry, the essential Shashi Tharoor. Shashi Tharoor in conversation with Pallavi Ayer. Award-winning writer and politician Shashi Tharoor is the author of 22 books of fiction and non-fiction. His unerring sense of humor lightens the substance of his work, which includes a powerful indictment of colonialism, a philosophical appreciation of the Hindu religion, and hard-hitting political critiques. The recent Pride, Prejudice, and Punditry is a collection of essays and pieces that range from the political to the personal. In conversation with author, uh, with, with Shashi is author and journalist Pallavi Ayer. Tharoor discusses his ideas, insights, convictions, and the many levels at which he engages with the world. Hello, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to this conversation with uh, Shashi Tharoor, who has long been a writerly idol of mine. And in fact, his 1989 book, The Great Indian Novel, is what sort of set me down the path of writing myself. And so it has quite a magical quality, a fairy tale, really, to be sharing a stage with him today, all these years later. Thank you. Now, in, the, in your um, collection that we'll be discussing today, in the introduction by David Davidar, the publisher and the author, he refers to the English journalist and critic Cyril Connolly as uh, listing three impediments in the path of the aspiring literary writer. And these three impediments were early promise, journalism, and politics. So it's almost as though, Mr. Tharoor, by your very existence, you were trying to refute poor Mr. Connolly. But I have to say that the overwhelming impression that I've been left with after having read this collection is firstly, of course, how broadly you range. Secondly, how passionately you feel about the ideas that you espouse. And thirdly, your erudition. And I don't want to keep the audience from any of these three things. 
Um, so I'll stop gabbing on and get right to it by putting you in the spot because why not? And also because I can't think of anyone who'd rise to the occasion better than you. So the title of your collection and indeed of this session is Pride, Prejudice, and Punditry. So can you give me an example of something you are prideful of, prejudiced against, and something you were completely wrong about as a pundit? <laughs> okay, well, first of all, let me thank you for your very generous opening remarks, uh, Pallavi, and, and to say that I admire your writing very much. Uh, Pallavi has a, a wonderful weekly mail that goes out to subscribers uh, called The Global Jigsaw, which I would recommend you to get onto because it really is a wonderful insight both into the world and into her mind, which is, which is a fabulous place to, to spend time in. Uh, having said that, um, Cyril Connolly uh, also mentioned the fourth thing, uh, which I also violated, and that was that the pram in the corridor is the enemy of promise, he wrote. So in other words, having children was also meant to be a no-no for writers. So shouldn't be a journalist, shouldn't be a politician, shouldn't have kids. Uh, and shouldn't be, shouldn't peak too early with the early promise. I don't know, I suppose I did manage to violate all of those, but Cyril Connolly is still quoted, so that shows that he may have more enduring value than, than, than uh, those who try and refute him. Coming back to the title, I mean, the title was really lightly tossed off, and, and I, I shouldn't uh, want you to interpret it all too seriously. But, you know, obviously the pride for me is very much the pride in India in this extraordinary experiment of pulling together this most diverse country on the planet, uh, creating a constitutional system to make it work, as we heard a little earlier this afternoon, and what is more, running it as a democracy, a, a diversity managed by democracy, which is practically unknown in the developing world before. I mean, it was unknown before India tried it, and it's still largely unknown, but we've been able to pull it off. And I've taken a lot of pride in being able, in our country being able to do that, Plus, of course, all the other developments that have made us a country which potentially has, in many ways, answers to some of the great enduring questions uh, of, of development, of pulling people out of poverty, of the technological directions of the next century, of international cooperation, that potentially India has so much to offer to be proud about. My prejudice is, is um, essentially against prejudice. It's, it's prejudice against those who instead of this rather broad, soaring, majestic vision uh, of India would reduce it in a narrow-minded way uh, to sectarian considerations, bigoted considerations, um, would, would discriminate against people uh, because of things they ha can't help being, such as their religion, their place of birth, their language, uh, their face, <laughs> whatever it may be. Uh, and and I, I, I um, do wear my prejudices pretty overtly on my sleeve, um, but at the same time, because I dislike prejudice, I, I, try not, I try to be as fair-minded as I can be against the prejudiced. And on the punditry business, um, you know, I, I, it'll sound terribly immodest to say I haven't really got anything wrong, other than to sort of look back, look back uh, uh, at, at my willingness, perhaps, to give my government the benefit of the doubt after it was elected in 2014. But, I mean, that's, that we can put aside because we have this time-honored tradition in India of not bashing our government on foreign soil, so I'll, I'll put that aside for the moment. Let me just say that, that, you know, my punditry has often been so anchored to the present and to broader trends around the present that I haven't ventured to make too many predictions, other than the obvious one of, you know, saying my party is going to win when it probably didn't look likely to and hasn't won for the last two elections, but that's something that every politician is supposed to do. We are supposed to radiate optimism about our own chances. Uh, if we don't believe we're going to win, why should the people vote for us, right? So that may be the only real mistake in terms of inaccuracy. Otherwise, there isn't too much predictive stuff in my punditry, and therefore fewer opportunities to be wrong. Fair enough. You know, in the first section um, of the book, you profile or write in depth about several of the founding figures um, of modern independent India, ranging from Gandhi to Nehru, Tagore, Patel, Maulana Azad, and so on. Now, you've often been called a neo-Nehruvian, and perhaps you could tell us if you agree with that description or not. Uh, but before that, 
I'd like you to imagine, Mr. Tharoor, if you would, that you are stranded on a desert island somewhere, and you had to pick one of these leaders to be stranded with. Who would it be? And before you answer, I want to hazard a guess and tell me if I'm right. I think you will pick Tagore. Uh, and I think you would pick Tagore uh, because he was really a great humanist who strove to kind of find this East-West um, synthesis and a sort of, he was a nationalist and a universalist at the same time, which is something that kind of comes across in your writings. So tell me if I'm right or you if are. I'm wrong. Am I? You are. But do yeah, elaborate. I mean, I yeah, I, I'm, I'm a huge Tagore fan, despite the handicap of not having read him in the original Bangla. Uh, but even his translations, not all of which, unfortunately, uh, are as uh, euphonious as they could be, because even great writers can translate themselves badly. There are some good translations about by others, uh, and they're getting better. But even, even in relatively unsatisfactory translations, uh, he's, he's genuinely a giant, and some of his gifts of, of metaphor, some of his uh, ideas of language uh, and, and of emotion and feeling uh, are enough to, to strum uh, the most jaded and unromantic heart. Uh, describing the Taj Mahal as a teardrop on the cheek of time, which uh, is something I've never forgotten once I've read it. Um, uh, or his, his uh, uh, magnificent poem uh, about the, the prospect of death which was actually found by Wilfred Owen's mother, copied out in his diary when the young poet was killed in World War I. Uh, a, po a poem called, When I Go From Hence, Let This Be My Parting Word. Absolutely magnificent stuff. Uh, and his, his, his romantic poetry, I mean, people think some of it is deliberately ambiguous that he could be referring to a lover, or he could be referring to God. Uh, but that's for you to decide. Certainly, if you imagine the lover, it's some of the most striking love poetry uh, uh, written in the 20th century. So there's all that. But even more than all of this, remember he was not only a great poet, he was a great playwright. Uh, at one point he had three plays running on, on the West End um, uh, at the same time. Um, uh, I, think, I think he was, the, he was an extraordinarily popular uh, playwright. Uh, he was uh, a writer of very impressive uh, prose of ideas. Uh, his lectures on nationalism, subsequently published as a book, um, very interesting. Um, obviously, not everybody would agree with his ideas, but you don't have to agree with somebody uh, to want to share their mind. In fact, it helps to disagree with them so you can have something to, to argue about. Um, and of course, the, the, the fact that he also, um, he also um, had a level of accomplishment across so many domains that you would never run out of conversational topics with him. Uh, so I think, stranded on a desert island, uh, I would say Nehru, oddly enough, does come close. Not because I call myself a neo-Nehruvian. A, I'm allergic to labels generally. I'll accept the neo part. But you see, there are too many uh, presuppositions about what a Nehruvian is supposed to be. Uh, and as people who've read my short biography of Nehru know, um, I, I uh, have enormous respect and, and, and uh, admiration for the man's mind and intellect. Uh, I share with him his passionate conviction uh, in favor of democracy and what was wrongly, in my view, dubbed secularism, which I simply see as a celebration and acceptance of, of pluralism. Uh, and on those, I'm completely on the same page as him. Um, I, might have, I might have deferred slightly on non-alignment, and I would have uh, had some trouble with the sort of statist interpretation of socialism, as he called it. I'm committed to social justice but I'm less sure that the government can do it all than Nehru was. So there are differences. I'm, I'm by no means somebody who's drunk at the fount of Nehruvianism and imbibed it whole. I mean, I do have my differences. But still, I, my admiration for him is almost as high as my admiration for Tagore. So it's interesting that you say that you might have differed with him a bit on non-alignment. Why is that? Could you elaborate on that? Well. I understood where he's coming from. I, 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 I'll say that what Nehru wanted was to assert India's authority as an independent nation to think for itself. Uh, and that's something that, and to decide for itself as well. Remember, for 200 years, we'd had another country telling us what to do and, and speaking for us internationally and deciding for us. And, and he said it's high time that we did that for ourselves. And so, um, the idea that soon after independence we would lock ourselves into an alliance 
which uh, would then collectively decide what was good for us, was something he was completely allergic to and had a lot to do with that desire for independence. In fact, there's a probably apocryphal story of how John Foster Dulles, Eisenhower's Secretary of State in the 50s, allegedly said to Nehru, uh, and Dulles, by the way, was a man who notoriously said that neutrality between good and evil is itself evil, in other words, implying that India's stand was evil. Uh, and and the, the story is, Dulles says to Nehru, uh, so uh, are you with us or against us? And Nehru replies, yes. In other words, I'm with you when I agree with you, I'm against you when I disagree with you, and I'll decide when, when it's going to be one of those things. So that's something that I actually fully understand. But I think where I, I, I would part company is on, 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 on a couple of things. One is certainly that non-alignment, uh, which gave India in some ways influence out of all proportion to its strength and its economy and its military resources in the world. Um, also, unfortunately, uh, was applied with somewhat less than an even hand. So our anti-colonial instincts kicked in the moment the British and the French landed in Suez in 56 and Nehru was out there demanding they leave and eventually with the Americans taking the same stand, the British and the French did leave and, and, and the Suez Canal got back into Egyptian hands. But um, when two years later the Soviets marched into Hungary, I'm sorry, the same year when Soviets marched into Hungary, uh, there was a resounding silence in New Delhi. So it wasn't, uh, you know, if you want strategic autonomy, then you really should be free to criticize everybody as you see fit. But if in de facto your reluctance to join uh, one side uh, implies that you are thereby uh, uh, beholden to the other, then, then it seems to me there's a problem. And of course, the second big flaw, which is impossible to get away from, was the, um, the capitulation to China and the fact that we had perhaps because of our illusions of a non-alignment, uh, led ourselves, in effect, we had disarmed ourselves. And we were in no position, despite the bravery of our, of our Jawans, we were in no position to resist the Chinese in 62. And it, when the Chinese who decided when to call off and, and withdraw, having, quote, unquote, taught the Indians a lesson. Uh, those, I think, would be the, the big flaws on which I would, I would have problems with, with Nehru's approach. Thank you for that. Um, returning to what you said about um, Tagore and how he was somebody who ranged very widely, I, I picked Tagore as being your companion because I saw that echo in how you approach the world and how widely you range. And indeed, in this collection, you know, you sort of go from cr cricket to politics, uh, from the global to the very local, from the personal to the political. And so you're in many ways this kind of boundary spanning human being. That is the way that you see the world. You sort of see bridges and you're connecting the dots. And increasingly we're in this uh, world of ideological silos where it, so it seems very difficult for people to make those bridges and to connect those dots and to reach out uh, uh, across these silos and just have, you know, conversations. Um, do you think that this is, uh, when it, one comes up with an assessment with it's getting harder for us to talk across ideological divides, is this because of a recency bias or do you in fact think that it is indeed getting harder for the world to sort of talk across these silos and we're seeing greater polarization than in the past? Oh, there's no question about that. There's polarization within almost every democracy that's much worse than it ever was. I mean, take the United States as, a, as an example where really um, the Republicans and Dem Democrats simply don't agree on anything. I mean, literally fundamental questions as well as subsidiary ones. And in India, um, where there was actually a long tradition of respect and courtesy across uh, political divides, uh, that's largely disappeared. Uh, and, and, and conventions are being discarded. Unless there is something that binds you by law, to a certain pattern of, of behavior, governments will simply ignore it. Um, and so, for example, uh, we had a convention in our country where uh, since the institution of the parliamentary committee system, the external affairs committee was always chaired by an opposition MP. The idea was to convey to the world that this rises above political divisions, foreign affairs is a national uh, issue. And so we had you know, people like Mr. Vajpayee, Mr. Gujral, and so on as chairman of that committee. And I was deeply honored to be made uh, chairman of the External Affairs Committee in my first term as an opposition MP, which was my second term in parliament. But um, no sooner had I been re-elected for my third term 
then the government decided that they wanted it for the ruling party. And because in our system, they can do that, even though, again, eight of our 24 committees are always chaired by opposition MPs, and that is an improvement on many other systems. Uh, nonetheless, there went my uh, chairmanship of the External Affairs Committee, but my example apart, there went this very precious convention that associated the opposition with responsibility for the conduct of uh, India's external relations. <clears throat> anyway, I ended up with the IT committee instead, and, and uh, we we're giving the government a good, good time on that. So I think uh, it's not entirely, entirely a loss. But where do you think that this impulse is coming from? Why are we seeing greater polarization? Um, what, you, know, you sort of described that this is happening around the world. How would you diagnose this? Well, I diagnose it slightly sort of in political science terms. There was this old classic uh, division that uh, the French uh, uh, political scientist uh, Maurice Duverger had come up with about 50 or 60 years ago, which is that all democratic conflict is of three kinds, either a conflict over basic principles, a conflict over subsidiary principles, or a conflict without principles. And he gave examples of each. Uh, a conflict over basic principles was a democracy where, say, there was a viable alternative communist alternative, like in France at that time, as he thought, or in India, whatever. A conflict over subsidiary principles was like the British system, where you had a choice between a conservative party and a, a socialist or social democratic party, the Labour Party, uh, and therefore there were subsidiary principles on which they disagreed, nationalization, government rule, etc., etc. And then you had a conflict without principles, which he said was the American example, where there really is no significant difference, he said, between Democrats and Republicans. And, and, and that classification is essentially melted away in today's politics. Every democracy is facing a conflict of us, fundamental principles. Uh, in America, uh, as I said, there's no uh, basic area in which the two agree. In India, um, uh, you're almost seeing one party that wants to reimagine and rework the nature of the state, of the nature of the country itself, the idea of India, that famous phrase of Tagore's, uh, versus another that wants to hold on to certain ways of doing things that uh, perhaps the country is moving on from, who knows? In, uh, in many parts of the world, that this kind of conflict has become so fundamental because one of the principal players, at least, has come with a radically different agenda from anything that's gone before. In recent years, it's usually an ethno-nationalist agenda, where you've got people rising to political prominence in countries uh, who firmly believe that they speak for a more authentic, more rooted idea of their nation than all the rootless cosmopolitans who have ruled before. And so suddenly there is this real, you know, are you with us or against us is, is right there. Um, you know, why is it there is absolutely no meeting place between a Le Pen vision of France and a Macron vision of France? Uh, there, there, there is no common ground similarly between Mr. Modi's vision of India and, and that of the Congress party or the, <coughs> or the Erdogan vision of Turkey and that of the secular parties in Turkey, and so on and so forth. And therefore, in every country you're seeing a far more fundamental difference on an essential fundamental principle of what the nation's all about. And that, therefore, has created a polarization where it's not as if you can pick and choose or find common ground. You either accept this vision or you don't, and you're one or the other. I don't think that you really address this um, in any of the essays in this collection, but to what extent um, or how would you diagnose the role of social media in the development of all of this? I mean, you're very active on Twitter. I follow you. So I'd be curious to know that. I think we have an entire panel on that tomorrow. But, um, uh, and I have addressed it in uh, uh, two of my books, in fact, uh, uh, early on in, in The Paradoxical Prime Minister. And then in uh, The Battle of Belonging, where I talk about the present situation uh, reasonably recently, I think it was a 2020 book, it came out in India during COVID, and here in Britain and America, it's called The Struggle for India's Soul. Uh, but there is a, a fairly hefty section on, on, on social media. But I would say, in, in short, that um, it has had a um, initially liberating effect on politics, making politicians more accessible to the general public, uh, uh, enhancing governmental accountability and the authorities' accountability, adding to transparency in the processes of governance, all of these are plus things. And then a subsequently excessively toxic effect as political parties and other agents have decided that 
this is too good a medium to leave in the democratic space. Let's try and manipulate it, let's try and influence it, let's create bots to generate opinions, let's try and have entire organized troll armies to abuse our rivals, let's uh, uh, shelter behind the anonymity that some of these sites permit in order to attack others. All of this has happened uh, and sadly happened largely uh, with impunity. So this has become a, a challenge because it's injected a certain kind of poison into the political space that I think this is, this is striking in, in my country and I was really speaking about India in, in everything I said, but if you look globally, you have the same mixture of good and bad. You'll find, for example, that social media helps save lives after major earthquakes like the Haiti earthquake and so on, where people were able to find people through social media. The Kerala floods uh, a couple of years ago, uh, rescue missions mounted by people tweeting uh, about people in distress and so on. All sorts of things could happen. But um, the, the negative, and of course, if, you, if you're in favor of them, the, the Jasmine Revolution and the, the, the various Arab Spring movements were enabled very much, both by social media and by television. Uh, satellite television made a lot, of, a lot of things possible. But the same thing has happened in those countries, uh, that it has created toxicity in the political culture of many parts of the world. A double-edged sword. Um, I'm sorry to keep returning to Tagore, but in one of your essays, you note that an American critic wrote acerbically that the Indian, that is Tagore, scolds Americans at $700 per scold. Um, leaving aside the exact monetary figure, do you think that such a description applies to you as well, that you've made it somewhat of a vocation to scold the British, you know, given um, your famous critiques of British colonialism while speaking in posh English, enjoying London, taking a break with a nice cup of tea, you know, all that nice English stuff. So how do you sort of reconcile your critiques uh, with uh, the enjoy, with the sort of fact that you've obviously a had uh, gained from that, from, from all of that as well. Tea was probably grown in India, but um, <laughs> nonetheless, no, you're, you're, you're right. You're right that, uh, that uh, I scold Britain, but not today's Brits. I'm really scolding uh, uh, both the, the colonial legacy, the, the history of those 200 years, which is pretty awful, and the, um, the ignorance about it, if you like, by, by many of today's Brits. I, I would like them to be aware. But as I've said in my own writings and speeches about my writings, I've said, you know, we must, we must forgive, but we, we must not forget. I think we need to know our history, just as any child ought to know the background of their parents or their grandparents, have a sense of where they come from. So must every society know about, uh, about its past and, and have a, a fairly uh, uh, broad-ranging appraisal of how we got to where we are today. So I, I certainly don't feel that... Um, that today's Britons are necessarily responsible for any of those things, and I won't hold it against them. I will relish seeing my country beat them at cricket, but that's another matter. Uh, uh, the truth is that, um, uh, that, that, you know, whether you like it or not, uh, those 200 years have marked us too, including the language you and I are speaking to each other right now. Uh, and um, I would probably go, go so far as to say that, um, that uh, in many ways, um, the parting uh, of Britain from India, that original Brexit in 1947, though in many ways it was shambolic and, and partition and the gruesome killings that accompanied it are really in many ways, um, you know, the old line about nothing became them as much as their manner of leaving and so on. <laughs> that this, I'm afraid, is an indictment, not a praise, because it really was a terrible way to leave, to abandon responsibilities and exit the way they did. Despite that, uh, it was a, a parting singularly free of bitterness. Uh, and what is striking is that almost immediately thereafter, um, India and Britain maintained, I mean, resumed and maintained a rather friendly and cordial relationship, government to government and people to people, that, um, that never featured uh, any significant resentments. I don't want to change that. I'm not here to promote uh, resentment or enmity. But I am here to promote awareness. Um, stirring consciences is a good thing, by and large, and I'm happy to do it. Returning to the fact... <laughs> of the language that we're both speaking in, 
Um, I wrote a piece a few months ago about uh, being Indian in English. And in fact, I think you retweeted it. Thank you, because it sort of quadrupled my Twitter following overnight. But in it, I talked about how um, English-speaking Indians in many ways do function as a caste rather than a linguistic uh, group. Um, but also that I had begun to realize how having this caste uh, might not have been the best thing for India. And uh, now, of course, you know, we're in the middle of languages become a hot wire, a live wire topic in India with uh, people in power suggesting that we uh, uh, scuttle English in favor of Hindi and so on. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about uh, what you think about the language, the fact that we as a country have no language called Indian. I'm constantly being asked whether I teach my children Indian, uh, and then I have to kind of go into this long explanation of the 22 official languages uh, or, or the constitutionally recognized languages and Did two you grow official speaking languages. One at home? I spoke English at home. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what's interesting is, um, I, I, mean, I think both your parents were Tamil speakers, right? Uh, my mother is from UP, so she oh was a God. Hindi speaker, and my father was from Tamil Nadu, but he grew up in, he was born in Gujarat and grew up in Dehradun, so he doesn't <laughs> speak Tamil all that well. But they didn't want to inflict Hindi on you either? He, well, my dad can't really speak Hindi very well. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what, what, what happened, I, I, I must say that, uh, this is not uncommon because there is a, uh, an urban educated uh, Indian population, small no doubt, the census says 2%, uh, who uh, really do think of English as their first language, it's a natural language. It is the language they speak at home, it's a language in which they go to school, it's a language in which they play with their friends and woo each other and fight with each other and all of that. So for us it's a very real living, breathing language and it's a natural language of our self-expression. And so my usual uh, approach is to, is to argue that India, that English is also an Indian language, uh, especially as our variants of it get more and more uh, authentically different from British and American and other versions of the English language. We are like that only. We are, only, we are like that only. I was just yeah. coming to that. Uh, or as, you know, you're all very decorously sitting one to a seat. If this was India, they'd be three people crowding into two seats together, and the third one would say, kindly adjust. <laughs> but anyway, um, the fact is that that's how... Uh, that's how and enter from the backside only. I know, that's how you... I love that one. <laughs> I was being a little more decorous than you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, so, so I think Indian, I mean, English, Indian English is a, is a good language, and it's also got a, a very impressive literature of its own, which should not be overlooked, which is very much part of... Uh, of what, um, what I think establishes a language's place uh, in, in a particular uh, cultural consciousness. Uh, the controversy about Hindi, however, um, is, is particularly BBC manufactured. We were actually getting along quite fine um, with a so-called three-language formula that no one honored. The three-language formula was supposed to be that you would have the language of your state, English as a link language and a third Indian lang a third language which would be an Indian language from somewhere else other than your state. So uh, in practice, uh, it meant that um, pretty much everyone learned English and Hindi in the urban areas, the big schools, and certainly in northern India. Um, nobody in the north bothered to learn a South Indian language. And in some southern states like Tamil Nadu, they refused to learn Hindi. So uh, it was honored in the breach, but at least peace had been maintained by it until the BJP came and chose to stir up this particular pot again with all sorts of undesirable consequences. In fact, in the 1960s, when an attempt was made to make Hindi the national language, there had been riots in which dozens of people were killed uh, because of their protests over this particular issue. It's not a Pandora's box you wish to open again. Uh, so I think it's most unfortunate. I mean, the fact is that uh, Hindi is the language of almost 50% of the population, just under. Um, uh, but that too only if you assimilate so-called dialects of Hindi, which are arguably languages in their own right, like Maithili and Bhojpuri and Avadhi and so on. If you consider them all to be Hindi, then you're about 48, 49%. But what about the other 51? And the, and the big question is, if you make Hindi the quote-unquote national language, it'll mean that half your people, or about half, will be able to function in government, in the judiciary, in public life, and every other way, 
in the language which they have imbibed with their mother's milk uh, and, and, and which they're most comfortable with, and the other half will actually be completely disadvantaged. Whereas if you have English as a linked language, everyone is equally disadvantaged or advantaged. And that is something which, which the, the sort of sense of alienation this will breed amongst the non-Hindi speakers is actually going to be colossal. So it, it's, it's, it's an issue you don't really need to open up because we were all getting along fine. Um, increasingly, for example, uh, national institutions like the National Civil Service, the courts, parliament, permit you to use your language, whatever it is. So in parliament today, Hindi is widely heard far more than, I mean, I'm told in the 1950s, only English was spoken by every MP. Uh, today, the vast majority speak only Hindi. In fact, we've reached a point where, again, in, in after discarding an existing parliamentary convention, uh, you can ask a minister a question in English and get an answer in Hindi, which has created some protests from Southern Indian MPs and so on. Uh, but anyway, so, so you've got that going. And as long as you give the translators 24 hours notice, you can speak in your mother tongue, whatever it is. You can speak in Assamese, you can speak in Malayalam, you can speak in, in whatever uh, you feel is best suited to express your ideas. And, and the government, the parliament is obliged to find a translator if enough notice has been given. And then the others can hear what you're saying through simultaneous interpretation. Uh, actually, going for, to, to one language is actually a retrograde step. And I think uh, it would disadvantage us very much in India. Worse, it would be a severe jolt to Indian unity, which I think is too precious to be monkeyed around with. Mr. Tharoor, you know, you say that your ideas uh, matter more to you than your words. And in fact, I quote you, you say, as a writer, I have been more concerned about the substance of what I had to say and the effectiveness of the way I say it than the actual words themselves. But in India, your sort of dictionary-like vocabulary has sort of defined you for many people to the extent in which if I ever tweet something with a word like uh, crepuscular, I normally get trolled with people saying, who do you think you are? Tharoor! You know, I get those kind of responses all the time. So do I never <laughs> say crepuscular. <laughs> well, why? <laughs> anyway, no, but do you... I'm never awake at dawn. Right. Do you worry at all that, so in some ways, that your legacy will end up being that of words, of the guy with the fancy words, rather than your ideas? Well, that would be awful, I'm sorry to say, so please, somebody here, preserve my legacy. No, I mean, the thing is that uh, I actually wrote that about my, my non-fiction writing. In fact, with fiction, I actually found myself saying to a lot of interviewers and so on that the telling of the tale is as important as the tale itself. And I, I prided myself that each of my novels experimented with a different narrative form and a different style. Uh, and and I, I, I'm proud of what I tried to do. Of course, they all require words as well. Uh, but I, I, I'm proud of what I tried to do in the, in, the, in the sort of way of unfolding the three different novels I wrote as stories. Uh, but when it comes to uh, nonfiction, uh, you really are trying to reach people uh, directly and, and therefore if you use fancy words, but your ideas don't reach them, then you've actually failed at what you're trying to do. Uh, I'm, I'm not writing you know, travelogues. I'm, I'm writing largely political or historical or opinion kind of books and, and, and articles, which are meant to strike home to people's minds. And so uh, that's where I said the ideas are more important. On this question of words, it really is a joke that's gone out of hand. Uh, it, it actually, uh, the, for those of you who haven't lived in India or have been living in India under a rock, what happened was that a few years ago, uh, when I was uh, facing a sustained campaign of calumny and vilification uh, from a certain section, shall we say, uh, uh, aided and abetted by their complicit uh, allies in the media, uh, there was one particularly egregiously offensive uh, uh, series which uh, was, was put out by a a particularly egregiously offending television journalist. Um, and I was so angry with that. Uh, he had launched a new channel and just wanted the TRP, so he decided to make up his own facts. And I've had to you know, take him to court, but the uh, judicial process being what it is, the case is still pending five years later. But my, uh, my moment of, of, of rage led me to issue an immediate tweet saying that this was an exasperating farrago of lies and half-truths, uh, half-truths and outright lies, um, 
Farago. Uh, uh, being broadcast, <laughs> being broadcast by uh, uh, a showman masquerading as a journalist, or something like that. No, apparently Farago, to begin with, is a word I'd used frequently since Stevens College in my debates in Delhi, Delhi University. It wasn't to me an, un an unknown word, but apparently it was because a few hours later there was a puzzled tweet from the Oxford English Dictionary asking why suddenly a million Indians had looked up the meaning of the word Farago uh, when, when. Uh, uh, when uh, I think the highest they'd ever had in any previous year was three or something, you know. So why were suddenly a million people looking it up? And then, uh, and then there was um, some people didn't understand masquerading either. But anyway, that's another matter. <laughs> uh, people started opening accounts, calling themselves Mr. Farago and referring to me as Mr. Farago. All sorts of things. The whole thing got completely out of control. And then they decided that this meant that I was uh, somebody who used words that people didn't understand, which. I feel rather sorry for myself about because obviously I pride myself on communicating effectively. And if you are going to communicate, you will need to be understood. So it was my foolishness that I hadn't realized that the world had moved on since I was at St. Stephen's College, Delhi University in the early 1970s. Having said all of this, I then decided, well, you know, if you're going to be tarred and feathered with this, you may as well enjoy it. So um, when shortly thereafter, six months thereafter, whatever, my publishers wanted me to announce the imminent availability of my then new book, The Paradoxical Prime Minister, I tweeted um, that um, my new book, The Paradoxical Prime Minister, is uh, shortly out, etc., and it's far more than just a 400-page exercise in floxy nor nihilification, which, <laughs> which, as some of you will know, is a, is a coinage from the 19th century, meaning the act of estimating someone or something as worthless. Uh, and that is precisely what, uh, what I then uh, uh, explained to them. But the thing caught on, and, and I'm afraid little kids aged three and four were being wheeled out by their parents to recite Floxy Norsi Nihilipilification onto YouTube videos and, and onto and, and my presence if they ever met me and so on. So it became a bit of a joke. But then, you know, things like uh, shortly thereafter, too, there was a, an episode where a, a, a politician who had been elected alongside us as part of a, uh, uh, an election campaign against the ruling party, resigned and joined an alliance with the ruling party. So I promptly tweeted um, the word of the day, Snolly Goster, first usage US 1846, meaning, and I gave the meaning, a shrewd, unprincipled politician, latest usage today. And I didn't have to mention him, didn't have to mention his state, didn't have to mention the incident. The word did it all. And I'm pleased to say that I now hear Snolly Goster being used a lot in Indian political commentary. So these things happen. Uh, in other words, it was, it was a joke that went out of hand a bit. But I do hope people will remember the ideas and not just the words. So I have tons more questions, some more in a sort of lighter vein and some more serious. But I had somebody saying we only have five minutes left. I'm not sure why. Well, that can't uh, be right because we because began. Because aren't we going yeah. all the way? Anyway, but what I will do is I will open it up for a few questions um, and then hopefully get one concluding question before we really have to wind up. Um, this young gentleman in the front. I think a mic is coming. Just wait for a second. Uh, if you stand up, she might know who to give the mic to. And tell us how old you are as well, please. It's not, it's not on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so um, my name's Jijith. I'm from Westminster. You can hold it closer to your lips, JJ. Uh, okay. Um, my name's Jijith, I'm from Westminster School and I'm 14 years old. Um, and my question is uh, to do with the comment that you made that you scold the British of those days um, for colonizing India and doing uh, things like that. Do you not think that we must also appreciate what they did in, in the terms of how they molded the India that is today and how they influenced the structure and how we run things today in India? Well, you should read my book, Inglorious Empire, which tells you why I don't believe there's anything to appreciate. Every single thing that you might appreciate today um, was created in India by the British to serve their own interests. There was not one thing that actually was, I mean, the English language wasn't, quote unquote, given to the Indians. Um, they, 
decided to teach a very small percentage of people just enough to serve as uh, an, an intermediate class between the governors and the governed, but they specifically decided not to uh, teach the language to the vast masses. That's one example. The railways were built in order to extract uh, goods uh, from the Indian interior, take them to the ports and ship them off to England, part of the drain and loot of resources that had gone on, uh, and also to send troops in to quell any disturbances against the, the loot and the rape, and so on and so forth it goes. I mean, the, the courts were created to dispense British justice, where um, uh, murders routinely committed by uh, white colonial officials of their own servants were exonerated, and, and the slightest uh, uh, hand raised by an Indian against a British colonialist usually ended, ended up either in the news or transportation for life or other sorts of penalties. There were very, very different standards of justice from what the British liked to imagine they stood for, and these, everything is footnoted with scholarship and not just by Indian nationalists, by, 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 by serious scholars around the world. So I, I'm sorry to say that I don't find uh, very much to appreciate for, the, for that. I think um, you can also have railways without going through the trouble and expense of being colonized. It would be much cheaper to just buy the damn things. Mr. Tarun, uh, this is, uh, my name is Manjiri. Where are you? Oh, oh hi. Sorry. I, my name is Manjiri Gokhale Zoshi. Uh, this is, uh, I think, our outstanding anchor for today, Pallavi. Uh, she started with the great Indian novel. And uh, this is a question which has dogged me since I read it a decade ago. So it's a pleasure to ask you. Uh, in the novel, uh, you've likened Nehru to Dhritarashtra as uh, the man who had everything except vision and uh, the, the, the one and only Indira Gandhi to Priya Duryodhani uh, who signified pure, un, pure evil, nothing else. In your own style, I'm asking you this question, has nobody in the Congress party read this book? <laughs> <laughs> and the second is in the same book you've likened uh, Shastri, Lal Bahadur Shastri uh, for, for dying. I mean, his only fault was that he died early, like Pandu did. And with him, has, he stood for integrity, as we all know. Do you think he was the last, or is there, you know, it's not about the Congress party or the BJP or any, but in the Indian politician today does not stand for integrity. Do you think it died with him? Hmm, that's quite a question. Uh, on that second question, the answer is, there are people of integrity, uh, even today in Indian politics. But whether they represent the norm or they are the exceptions, I think your own question points to, to what the answer might be. On the first one, actually, first of all, it's a satirical novel. So you're not supposed to take all these battles totally literally. The creative freedom of the, of the novelist is precisely to be able to play with these metaphors and these ideas. Uh, <clears throat> And so, so every character corresponds, every character from the Mahabharata corresponds to something else uh, in, in the 20th century politics of India. But Dhritarashtra, because he was blind and literally couldn't see, now he had no vision in the, in the literal sense, actually is depicted as having figuratively a huge vision. The problem is that, that vision is disconnected from ground reality because he can't see ground reality. That was the conceit. So it wasn't a wholly negative uh, portrayal. And the idea is most of these, most of these characters are, are complex. I mean, I, I'd like to think anyway that they are. And, and that's one of the interesting things about the Mahabharata. There are no pure heroes in the Mahabharata, the original Mahabharata. I mean, there are gods with feet of clay. There are humans who, who may be idealized in some respects, but are deeply flawed in others within the same person. So in those circumstances, uh, uh, an epic which has room for that kind of doubt and incertitude about human beings, uh, which, which uh, permits you to, to explore uh, the complexities of human nature, it seemed to me much more ready to lend itself to satire than say something like the Ramayana would be because the characters in it are worshiped literally by millions of people and you couldn't really do anything without tripping over into sacrilege. In the Mahabharata you could because it's a very human, one might we almost call it a secular epic. The gentleman with the glasses. Yeah. And the lady as well, together. perhaps just to be. Yeah. And the lady after, after him. Maybe we'll take both the questions together. Is that all right? Yeah, we'll take both together. Okay, is it? Yeah. Um, 
Pallavi, you definitely have done an incredible job of uh, anchoring this session. We've seen Shashi several times over the last few years, but this was, I think, really well matched. So we hope to see you here again. Thank you. Um, I agree. Thank you, Pallavi. Shashi, in the UK, we're quite proud about our queen, um, James Bond, and quite prejudiced when it comes to who should play the Queen or James Bond. And um, we don't think an Indian, an Indian from India, could play James Bond. So James um, Bond Padhyay, perhaps. <laughs> so you, you have a style, an aura, uh, a Britishness, almost oh an English God. gentleman. Oh. And. Uh, Tarur 007, yes. My phone number with, ends with, with 007. With, with rather big really words. And uh, you talk about preserving your um, legacy, especially to be known for content and not just big words. <laughs> so if your biography were made into a film, do you see an Indian playing you? <laughs> or oh, yeah. would you look to the UK? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that is so amusing. Thank you. Now, I couldn't be 007 because I'm not sure I could shoot straight, uh, except when I speak. Then I do tend to be a straight shooter as much as possible. But anyway, uh, short answer is, uh, you know, your guess is as good as mine. I don't think anyone's going to make a bio pick about me, but if they do, it should be an Indian. Hi, <laughs> Shashi. Sorry. After that question, this is a little bit more of a serious one, so... <laughs> um, I think she was being very serious. <laughs> <laughs> she probably was. The name's Tharoor, Shashi Tharoor. <laughs> but uh, Pallavi, I mean, uh, there's was, there was already a, call, a question, discussion on the great Indian novel. Uh, but one book of yours, which uh, I was very deeply affected by, uh, after I read the great Indian novel, is surprisingly the one that's lesser known. Actually, I actually have a copy of it with me, The Elephant, The Tiger and The Cell Phone, mm -hmm. right? I, I love the book. I mean, especially because of the NRA perspective that it brought in. And right. And I, I deeply... Literally, I was not yet... I, it was my last year before moving to India. Exactly. So, you know, I personally identified a lot with that. As okay. an NRA, who had come from Dubai to India, and now I'm in the UK, etc. So, uh, but from that point of time, I mean, your perspectives are very fresh in my head. To this book, which is now Pride, Prejudice and Punditry. You know, how has that perspective of both you as a person, who's changed from then to now, as well as your perspective on the world around, which is now reflected in these essays. Because I have read reviews that, you know, there are, uh, there are certain changes in the whole thing. But I'd like to hear your own thoughts on how that's changed from the elephant, tiger, and the cell phone days to the uh, pride, prejudice, and punditry days. Okay, I'll try and be brief. I mean, I think <coughs> elephant, tiger, and cell phone was a book written in 2007. It was actually the year that I had left the UN, had not yet returned to India. Uh, it, was, it was seeing... Uh, India, that cusp of heady optimism when everyone was expecting uh, it to be um, uh, uh, this new sort of economic giant um, growing, at the same time a thriving free market democracy. In fact, the American edition has a subtitle, uh, uh, the, next Indian, the next superpower or something like that. I mean, they, they really thought it was, uh, those were the words that were being bandied about at the time. And so the transformation of the slow lumbering elephant of cliche to this sprightly bounding tiger that was emerging, that was what it was about, and the cell phone was the instrument that seemed to embody it. And I was fortunately right about the cell phone. In fact, all the numbers in the book are out of date because we kept breaking uh, the world record for the number of cell phones sold and the number of users and so on right through. And, and today we have something like 900 million uh, cell phone users in India. Um, but um, I think the things that have changed are the things that I least expected to see change. Uh, because I came back to an India that, in essence, in spirit, was still the India I'd grown up in. There were superficial changes, a much more consumerist society than before, lots of foreign goods available that were unavailable when I was growing up in India, all of that stuff. But those were essentially superficial ones. Essentially, India was still the same sort of country, everyone trying to get along, everyone, uh, of course, on the make for themselves, um, uh, trying to you know, e either get out of the way of the government, or better still, I mean, that famous line, um, 
India grows at night when the government is asleep. I mean, that was happening. Uh, you, had, you had all that uh, heady excitement, and there was really, um, democracy was even more successful and effective than before. Um, people were freer, the media was brighter and more independent. Institutions uh, that you know, seemed to be incipient when I left to go abroad uh, 34 years previously had now become flourishing and effective autonomous institutions. That has, all that has changed dramatically. And it's changed specifically in the last eight years where you're seeing a country where um, all sorts of things that I would say were unimaginable to me, both when I left and when I returned to my country, um, has now become possible. Things that used to be inconceivable that people would even utter behind the privacy of their closed doors are now being declaimed from public platforms. Things of bigotry, of hatred, of, of, of verbal violence against, uh, against people, against minorities and other communities. Uh, we are seeing um, the hollowing out of institutions. We're seeing a, a cowed and complacent uh, media. Uh, uh, we're seeing uh, uh, all, sorts of, all sorts of developments uh, that almost represent a reversal of what in 2007 I would have seen as the trends to celebrate in India. Now, is it irreversible again? I don't think so. If such a major thing can be reversed, we can perhaps put it back on track again. But it requires the Indian public and the Indian voter to decide they want it back on, an, on, on another track or whether they're happy with the way the country is going today. But the fact that it's different, no doubt about it. I think we have time for one more question before I'll wrap up. I came across. Is it out? Oh, okay. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question because um, I came across, I'm an artist, but I came across someone asking me, because I, I said I'm Indian, and then they were like, why don't you identify as your ethnicity? Because I'm from the Northeast, Mekalia, from a tribe called the Pinars. And so I wanted to, I didn't have an answer to that, and I wanted to know if you have an answer to why certain people won't say they're Indian, but they would say they're Punjabi or Pnar or like Assamese. Well, what was special about India was you could be both, you see. I mean, you could be a good Bengali, a good Muslim, and a good Indian all at the same time, if you wanted to be. And each identity mattered to you more in different contexts. Uh, you know, if, 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 uh, if you were in a gathering of people from your states, you might identify more as a Bengali. If you were going to the mosque for a prayer, you might identify more as a Muslim. If you're meeting in a mixed gathering or at a university or a school, you might identify you by a national thing. So uh, people can be all of those things. You can be many things and one thing all at the same time. And, and what gave us all the security to be secure in these multiple identities was the sheltering carapace of the Indian identity. So you can say, I'm from Meghalaya, or I'm from the Northeast, or I'm a Khasi, or I'm a Jantia, whatever it is that, that you know, tribally you may want to identify with. Uh, if you go to church, you might say you're a Christian. If you go to temple, you might say you're Hindu. In those contexts, but if people ask you which country you're from, you should say you're Indian, because you are. And I think we would, all of us, all the Indians here, would be equally comfortable embracing all these identities. That's what I talk about, the diversity, the pluralism of India and that embodies that. Pallavi. You know, so many questions left, including I wanted you to tell me about your adventures and being the sexiest, voted the sexiest vegetarian or something like that. Uh, but I don't think we have time for that today. Um, that was several kilos ago, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> this is the hottest vegetarian, actually, not the sexiest vegetarian. But, um, you know, I think uh, a lot of us have this question because you are a member of the Congress party and that is the opposition. And as you said, we are at this inflection point in India today where we're seeing this old pluralistic idea of India come under attack and uh, we're seeing a very different India of gaining ground and we see a very sort of absent opposition. So I mean to end with if I could just ask you like wither the Congress. The answer is I don't know and I think the public of India will have to decide that. Um, I feel it's a bit unfair to speak about an absent opposition because the opposition is there struggling to make itself heard um, and, and there are various reasons why it isn't heard very much. Part of it may be its own fault, part of it is also the fact that, um, that uh, 
the media may not give it the space it deserves, the fact that social media is dominated by agents of the ruling party and its ideology. There are various factors. And of course, we have seen a splintering of the opposition in the last couple of elections, which means that there are now 46 parties represented in Parliament. BJP has a majority all by itself. And then there's a one-person party, a two-MP party, that sort of thing all over the place. Um, and, and no behemoth in the opposition to sort of threaten the government with constituting an immediate alternative. That is the problem, if you like, rather than an absent opposition. It's a fragmented opposition that we have. And I think the Congress is, is quite capable of being and serving as the linchpin of an alternative. Um, I think clearly in the way things are right now, it cannot hope alone to take on uh, the government, the BJP and its brute majority. But if it were to more effectively make common cause with other parties, including parties um, uh, which are regional parties anchored in specific states, but which broadly share the sort of simplify, I can say, the broad sort of social democratic principles in which the Congress party is anchored, um, center or slightly center left, um, then that I think is, is certainly the way forward. Um, and the, the, the realistic alternative for the voters of India then will be a choice between a, a, a BJP uh, dominated government as we've seen for the last two terms or a, um, a coalition of very many parties uh, centered around the Congress party. That's the best I can say at this point, but there are two years to go, and I think a lot of ferment in the opposition space right now. Let's see how it all works out. So on that note, I hope this has given you a lot of food for thought. Please put your hands together. Big round of applause. Shashi Tharoor. Thank you, Pallavi.